All right, welcome to our admin and public works committee meeting for Tuesday, June 7th. I do have a special request by Mr. Travis to uh, just remember that when you speak to use the microphone and push the button when you start speaking and of course, turn it off when you're finished. So that is the special announcement for the day that I covered off. All right, then we're gonna start with our roll call. Just Steven. I turned on the microphone. Okay. <laughs> um, Chair Garitano. Here. Council Member Bertolino. Here. Chair, uh, Council Member Clark. Here. Council Member Edens. Here. Council Member Farmer. Here. Council Member Hopper. Council Member Jackson. Here. And Council Member Nyan. So we'll move on to the next part of the agenda, the approval of the May 3rd minutes. Is there a motion for approval in a second? Made by Council Member Farmer, seconded by Council Member Jaxi. Any questions or comments on the minutes? Made by Mr. Uh, Mr. Farmer, go ahead. Um, I'm almost certain that I abstained from the minutes last time because I wasn't on the committee yet. So we just update that, that'd be great. Okay, so you're making up for an abstention from last time. <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, Justina, you got that uh, down uh, about Mr. Farmer, his note that we'll need to modify the minutes to reflect that he abstained approval of the minutes at the last meeting. Correct. All right, any other questions or comments on the minutes? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of approval of the minutes say aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstain? Abstain. We have one abstention, Council Member Clark. All right, minutes are approved. Item number three on the agenda is public participation. Is there anyone from the public here that wishes to speak? This is Mr. Chair, no, Thank you, Travis. So no uh, participants at this time. We'll move on to the next part of the agenda. We'll move to administration. Uh, we do have under for information, the update on accessibility. I did speak with Council Member Clark and we're going to um, wait till the next meeting or do you have something you wanna share regarding this? I just have one point to okay. share. And um, we did have the music on main and there was um, not an interpreter that I spoke with Mr. Venich who said that he is working on that, that um, they needed two interpreters and only one was available. So he has made sure that two are available for the rest of the year and um, for all of the music on Main and um, for all of the other music related um, activities that we have. I would suggest though that we make it a point to have a backup agency that we can call in case something like this happens again. All right, thank you for that. And to add on, uh, and I mentioned to you, but for everyone, I, it's on the list for Celebrate Wildwood to the interpreters. So uh, I did see that there. So we'll take that information relay back to uh, Mr. Vunich to seek a backup. And if you have any recommendations uh, of any organization or backup, that might be helpful for him. Okay, moving on next, we have administration for action. We have an update on the Deer Management Subcommittee. And I am going to call on ex officio council member of this committee, Mr. Rob Rambo. Uh, he has presented us with a very detailed report and I commend you really well done report, good read. So I would like for you to maybe provide a synopsis um, just a quick synopsis for everyone, because obviously they have the report, but we'll uh, look for any direction from the committee if we should uh, take the next step with this at this time. Certainly express your thoughts on that if we move this forward to council uh, and uh, anything else you want to share. So sure. I'll pass it on to you. Uh, Mike is verified on. Um, yeah, my personal marching orders to myself uh, when we undertook this late last summer was to produce a comprehensive, uh, factually accurate report that provided a clear path to 
a, a binary decision, do something or do nothing. Uh, I think I met that goal with this, um, that those goals sort of argue against a handful of bullet points. And so this is, you know, it's pretty dense, you know, at 10 pages of, of, of writing at least, but um, it covers all the bases, which means no one can accuse this committee or council of, uh, you know, dropping the ball or missing something that's meaningful. So um, uh, it, it, what I did try to do was create a one-page executive summary uh, in the front, and there's another one-page cost example that spells out the bulk of the costs, and um, it does make it a binary decision. Do we do nothing, uh, or do we, do we take an action similar to the one recommended at you know, some similar cost? And um, I think the case uh, is clear for action. And I tried to spell out everything that I could about the, um, about the impacts of deer overpopulation. I, I moved that to the appendix finally to, um, to uh, make the body of the report a, a little bit more accessible. So I encourage you if, you, if you stop at the references, you're missing a couple of key pieces of the, of the um, the document. So I'm, I'm, it's down to a choice. And um, I'm really here to ask, to answer questions. Um, you folks didn't get as much of an opportunity to thoroughly review this as I would have liked, but I was anticipating a meeting in July because I thought this meeting was canceled for some bizarre um, uh, reason. And um, so we, sub I submitted it at the last minute to make sure that would get on on the clock, but you, if there are significant concerns, we do have time because the first actions uh, don't have to take place until after the first of the year in the 2023 budget. Um, so there's a, there's a little bit of time to, um, to get, uh, if we decide to, to take action, to get an RFP from, uh, uh, from the right organization and uh, you know, make do some of the other. Plans. So does anybody have any questions about what they've seen so far? Let me check to see. Let's see if there's any questions. Councilmember Clark and Eden's afterwards. Yeah, you mentioned in the report about all of the time and um, energy that it will take for the city staff to to do the the proposed um, project if we went with the, the lethal action and a professional that it would take some time for the city staff. And um, is that is is that feasible? Have we done a feasibility of that? Can they, do they have time and um, resources to do that? It will, that's an open question and a good one. It will, um, uh, I, my intention was to raise it as a, you know, a potential barrier or as an issue that we solve together, but there's not enough data to understand, you know, how many man hours it's going to take for the staff. But what I will say is um, the, um, the, the, the particular nonprofit organization that I recommend herein uh, can provide a pretty much a turnkey. Just it's just minor administration, like uh, like Rick and his staff do every day. There's a contract to administer, and there's you know people that you know uh, performance to track, and you know the the little questions and details that come up in the in the in course of the action. But the um, the, the the point you're asking about, uh, I may not have been clear enough, but it was about um, creating an amateur, a sport, rec a sport or recreational archery program to um, either to try to reduce the population in certain areas where we can't take any other actions or to um, manage the population when we get it to an acceptable level, which I think may have some power uh, because if, if we're counting on reducing the population um, to a particular level and then keeping it at that level by taking out six or eight year per square mile for the foreseeable future, that's doable by, um, by uh, hunters. And if they want to um, volunteer and follow the rules and do the tracking that's required and um, prove their competency and have um, 
you know, liability insurance and those kinds of things that are covered in the document there, they um, can probably provide a public service, but it's going to come at some effort, administrative effort from uh, Rick's department or, you know, whatever department decides to pick this up. And I don't know what that effort would be. It may be substantial. There aren't a lot of examples out there, um, you know, in a municipality because most folks either um, try and fail to do it with archery and they have lots of problems from, you know, uh, complaints of various kinds uh, that, that, you know, a, a, a herd of, of sport hunters causes in a community or they, um, they bite the bullet and spend the money and, and do it, you know, have professionals do it and then they don't have any problems. So I, I kind of talked around that, but um, I don't have a good answer. Uh, I do think that a, a turnkey program is probably the way we need to go for the first uh, for the first pass of this. Sure. Just to follow up, and of course, I was asking the question because I I'd been asked that question and wanted to get that answer out for for um, some of the residents. But um, is this something that? I, I won't make it yet, but is this a, something you want us to have a motion on tonight to go ahead with that, uh, uh, looking deeper into that plan, or what is it we're doing tonight? Well, I would uh, ask of the committee if the committee feels comfortable to move it forward to the uh, would be to the council at this point, you know. So because we have the Deer Subcommittee hasn't met in a while. So unless there's a reason, we already have Mr. Bertolino who's a member of that group and I'll look for your opinion on that. Uh, unless you want to comment on that right now. But if I could, Joe. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, Rob, thanks so much for this report. It was really, really well done. I really appreciate all the okay. effort uh, you've put into it. Uh, am, I, am I oversimplifying it at all? If I turn to page 10, and basically say that here, here are the here are the recommendations, one non-lethal and the other lethal um, recommendations that you would propose that the city undertake. Is that am I am I narrowing it down too much for you, or, or is that uh, really it? No, uh, it's um, it's not. I think a no feed ordinance at the top can't shouldn't be discounted because that's a a, a no cost or low cost and um, you know low effort straightforward uh, solution that will really do us some good no matter what else we do and that could be carried forward immediately um the um the the other questions uh, to back to teresa's for a second if you don't mind the organ the particular organization white buffalo they would be happy to come and talk to either this committee or this council before we ask them for an RFP. And I think asking them for an RFP without getting our input and answering all our questions and so on and so forth might be getting a cart before the horse just a little bit. And so I would suggest that action, just um, you know, reach out to them for a, a sort of a consultation with the appropriate folks. If it's, com if it's, um, if it's this committee, it's fine. If it's council, fine. And I think that makes a, a, a whole lot more sense. Well, Joe. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Debbie. Yeah, if, if I may, um, my recommendation at this point, I think, Joe, would be <clears throat> this poor can has been kicked down the road so many times that we've run out of road and the can's gone. It's just uh, we need to do something. Um, and I guess twofold. One, I'd like to think that this tonight that this committee, our committee can make a recommendation to the council that says that the council adopt or consider adopting because it's up to there as you said it's a binary we do we don't right uh, a a decision that rec these recommendations be adopted um as the deer management policy for the city and then the council can take it from there and say yes or no we we want this and we're willing to spend the money or we don't want to do this and it's the end of the end of the road no more kicking the can we're not going to do it okay that's what i would recommend we do tonight is make that recommendation and but before i shut up uh rick whose shoulders does this fall on if if it comes back that the council says yes let's do it is that a public works um is it fall in your area and uh, how would you if the council says yes we want to accept and adopt these recommendations what's what's the implementation process can i defer to the city administrator on that question <laughs> <laughs> I, I can I can add some I, a little bit of, I can put shed a little bit of light on that before Rick um, completes his his uh, 
comments. Um, the expanded recreational archery hunting, again, that's where the, um, the manpower component um, is likely to reside. It would, it would be sort of a turnkey contract administration for the professional, um, the, the lethal deer management program, and having a bunch of archers out there that are trying to pick up the dribs and drabs, that's where the effort's going to be. And um, I, I don't, um, I think it might be substantial. And so I want to make, make it clear that I'm ne not necessarily recommending this expanded recreational archery hunting. That's something that should be explored maybe with Rick's assistance and that of some others. I'm really just recommending professional deer management program and seeing what they say about that other recreational element. Does that, does, does that clarify things? Yeah, it does. And, um, you know, I think I'd be interested in hearing what Rick said, as I do want to give Councilor Member Edens a shot. Uh, she had asked to, to speak as well. Uh, but I do think we have two options here at this committee as far as moving forward. Uh, we can either send this to the full council for recommendation, but to council member Berlino's point, then it's going to have to go somewhere to actually work. Or we can, in this committee, for example, the no feed ordinance, we can do a motion to have the city attorney draft that up. And then we send it to the council. It's already good to go before, because otherwise you are going to bring something to the council that then still needs to be built out. Um, you know, as far as language goes. So we have two options and we can either do it a la carte, break out the no feed piece, then, uh, you know, either pursue doing additional, you know, that RFP out of this committee or an appropriate committee wherever Rick thinks might be a better place. Um, so I'm gonna jump in yeah. out, of, out, of, out of line here. Um, the, um, the no feed ordinance, I think I put one, I think I put Creve Coors as one of my references there are several communities um, from which to choose. They're all online, you can find them. Yeah. And um, Creek Course has been in place the longest, it's successful uh, and so forth. But the um, uh, around Wildwood, there are a lot of folks that really like feeding the deer. And so we need to figure out how to um, enforce you know, such an ordinance without taking a whole lot of people off. So that's sure. the challenge there. All right, Rick, maybe you have an opinion on this and then we'll go to Council Member Eads. Well, I, I would, I guess I need to clarify, we have not talked about this internally in terms of how we would implement these recommendations just yet. So be clear on that. Um, I would need to bring it up with Steve Cross. I, I could see a situation where it would be, well, I personally feel like the police would need to be involved. You're talking about hunting with rifles and folks out there shooting deer. That's a public safety. That's right up the police's alley. That's my opinion. And, and I would think they would probably want to be very involved if not take the lead in it, frankly. Um, but again, we have not talked about it internally, to my knowledge, just yet. Um, but Public Works has a role. I'm sure we'll do our best, whether it's just contract administration or that kind of thing. But I think the police need to be involved and uh, very, very uh, aware of what's proposed. Or you know, this is if we went to the turnkey program with the White Buffalo, that kind of thing. And they're involved with the Board of Public Safety, right? They have a seat there. So that might be one body that has already the police representation in there. I do want to give council member Edens now her opportunity, Go ahead. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm going to make a motion a little bit, but I first want to explain the thought process on this. So I do want to go ahead and, and move forward with a no feed ordinance. I think this document makes a really good argument for why um, it would be worth doing now and not as a total package. And that's because it's important that the deer get used to um, being attracted to bait to then be unfortunately called rather than just going to the, the, the current yards that they go to for a snack. And it allows us to have some time to start that public education process. We do have a lot of work to do teaching about chronic wasting disease, what the um, appropriate population number and target is, and, and why we're going to be taking action. So um, I, I'm ready to move forward with that. The other thing is... Um, you know, because it would probably get sent back to public works anyway. And if you really sit and think about it, we all seem to be on the same page with ready for it to put some dollars towards a deer management committee, plus Rob. So together we have nine votes. So we would already know it would pass council. 
And I would be surprised if our colleagues would also not support it as well. Although it is important that they have input, I'm just saying that's um, maybe a step that we, we don't have to take because we know it could make it through council if, uh, as Director Brown indicated, um, he needs more internal time and um, it would behoove us to probably have um, a, a plan with uh, White Buffalo as an organization to help us narrow down one of the um, areas that Councilmember Rambo identified um, and help us do a, a five to six year plan, which I think would be an appropriate number. Um, I'm surprised I didn't have a couple of residents here today. I've had several emails recently, people that have been requesting copies of the report, people that are concerned. So I know our residents are certainly ready for action. Um, so the motion I'm gonna put forward is that we um, proceed with a recommendation um, for uh, language to go to council for a no feed ordinance. As a sidebar, the, the wording that, that attorney Young might have to include would be that exceptions are made for the city for feeding for perhaps a bait and call program so that we're not in violation of our own ordinance, right? So that if you are part of the deer management program, you are somehow exempt from that. Um, but if you're a regular citizen, uh, that's, a, that's a hard no. Okay, so the second part is that, um, that the committee, um, uh, approves the, the, the draft deer management plan with a um, action expected. So outreach made to White Buffalo for a five to six year uh, deer management professional plan. And we expect to see that within, I think a, I think a month and a half. We can have them come, come you know, meet with us first because this is that was my okay. that was my uh, design. They may say it's more cost effective to, to do it all at once or to do it over ten years. Who, who knows? Okay, so the the motion will be to start that process with with White Buffalo then for a professional deer management plan, including um, costs and, and location for and five this, to six years. Just to clarify that second part of your motion with White Buffalo, and you know, obviously we'd have to go through an RFP process. Are you proposing that be done within this committee or is that the well the official public? motion is to start those talks so if they want to come talk to us that gives us the flexibility that council member rambo talked or if they have the ability to bring an rfp with them because that's more efficient and that's what they do every time a, a city contacts them or I'd, I'd be more than happy to see that so if you do have a motion on the floor, I uh, just want to check. There's a second by Council Member Jackson, Council Member Clark with some, with your hand up with question or uh, comment. Yes, um, I I don't know if we want to put this in the min or uh, as an amendment or um, part of the motion, but to to specify that this is for phase one, the phase that gets us from you know cuts it in half, not for the total plan to get us to the final because that's going to take another plan to get to it i would i would be amenable to, to that and language change i mean when i said it adopted the plan it kind of included it but it wasn't expressly stated so that's the intent of the motion so feel free to specifically add that thank you i see council member rambo's hand up there is a um the the larger the largest component of the um, deer feed, uh, no feed ordinance will be public education so that people understand, you know, why we're doing it and, um, you know, what their responsibilities are and the rationale behind it and so on and so forth. I can't overemphasize that. But what I will say is that the police, uh, Captain Mundell, already has this document and has had it for a while. It's under review, but Brad Wendling was our sort of quasi deer management specialist on the force and he retired. And there is a, uh, a, a woman, I believe at the, she may or may not be an officer, but she is at the county headquarters, uh, the, the county police department headquarters. And she does nothing but help municipalities with deer management problems of all kinds. I think she's the one reviewing this document, but they are um, ready to be involved. But um, I think they're only too willing to 
let Bi White Buffalo manage the whole thing because White Buffalo has a presence in the community. They've been in town and country. They've been in other places around here to great success. And it's, you know, documented success. The city managers like them. It's, they make it pretty much hands off for the city and so on and so forth. But I, I want to say that White Buffalo is the only um, uh, nonprofit organization of this kind that I know of. And I, you know, dug really hard to try to find others. So it may not be this typical three RFP, you know, try to get as many responses as we can. It may be more like the internet. Okay, well, these are the only folks that can do the job for us. And so we'll try to get the best deal that we can, you know, from, from, from them and get some clarity from them. So I just want to throw all of those facts out. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, I just want to ask uh, Councilman Bertolino, you know, with you being on the Board of Public Safety, with the police representation there um any thoughts on that like do we do we want to get their input in this committee or have that committee get involved in some way um i'm not sure they've been involved from day one joe so i think it, the fact that uh council member rambo gave a copy of this to captain mundell and they're reviewing it at the county level i think is really all we need to do at this point okay well i guess maybe once we get the rfp i would probably feel better if the police take a look at it too just to make sure that it goes along with our city ordinance so we can forward that to them uh, as to what what buffalo does and how they do their work and they're observing our laws um, they will they quite yeah. likely have more concern with any uh recreational elements that we try to induce and also, what are we going to ask them to do in terms of enforcement of a no feed ordinance? Because that's, you know, that could be, you know, granny out feeding the deer. She'd been doing it well, for 40 years and, and so forth. And um, do we really want to cite her? Okay. Council Member Jackson. Yeah. Council Member Edens mentioned the um, making the motions and getting the ball rolling because we also know that there's an education component to this. So I have a question. It's generic. I maybe Rick is the right guy to answer it or anybody, frankly, on the bench here. What does that look like? How do we need to do we need to do something to start the education process? Do we need to make a recommendation to have public works start something? How, well, um, it depends, uh, and I guess what we could do is ask the Department of Public Works uh, in consultation with the city administrator and whoever else that they put together a communication plan. Um, you know, it may be dependent on passing the ordinance first, or maybe the communication plan preempts it by starting to inform. Uh, so there's different routes and options, but I would say let them put the plan together. We can be made aware of it, certainly provide input. Yeah, I, then I guess I would absolutely make that recommendation, Rick, that you guys get to work on it. Regardless of what happens here, you've got at least a little bit of direction that we're heading uh if the motion goes to the council and is approved for the no feed ordinance which i i like council member edens believe it will be i mean you already know there's going to be a need for some level of education so i would definitely recommend start looking at that okay yeah. so we will rick i think you've got that to discuss yeah no i think that's but that's clear all right well let me i think this is good we've got some next steps here as far as Having the city attorney draft the ordinance, that was your first part on the no feed. We'll see it. There's some examples that have been provided uh, that Council Member Rambo said other cities have done. So I think that's good. We'll look at that when that comes back to us. Uh, and then the second part would be the initiation of the RFP with you know this vendor to see what they come back with, with the proposal for our city. You haven't paid I was just going to say, we, we just kind of had a, a sidebar discussion um, based on um, what Council Member Jaxie said, because there is a fall gazette, and that would be an excellent time to have a nice article about deer and why we don't feed them. And and so getting getting this passed in time for that to go out to every household would be a good timetable to be on. I'll let Council Member Jaxie and Rambo draft that. <laughs> He's, he's, he's a writer. Um, yeah, so, so um, we ask our staff to do a lot. And um, just, you know, churning around trying to figure out.
Okay, I think we've had some good discussion here and some clear next steps. Anybody have anything else before we just uh, vote on this? All right, seeing now those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstain? All right, the motion passes. And you got that, Justina? Who? All right, perfect. All right, moving on then, uh, we will move to the second item under for action, which is developing a policy regarding sunshine requests by council members. And I'll provide uh, just some background on this because we've had this out on our um, list of topics for future agendas for a while. So um, we, we do not currently have any policy with regards to when council members make sunshine requests and the uh, thank you the uh, the idea behind this policy is that it will um, be able to basically council members be treated the same way as members of the public when it comes to making these sunshine requests with except, with some exceptions where if it's business that's relevant that's being discussed before the council or before committee um, obviously that would be excluded from that policy because you need it to do your work or if you have to uh, respond to a resident's questions regarding that. But it's more for just making sure that it doesn't get abused for issues that are not being discussed, that then you know, the proper channel is followed. So the idea uh, is to see if this committee is in agreement, we would uh, ideally ask the the attorney draft the policy that we can see when it comes back to this committee uh, and provide him with that direction to do that. Any questions or comments? Councilmember Edens. I'm going to go ahead and make the motion that we have uh, the city attorney prepared draft legislation for us with, a, with exactly as, as you stated, um, exceptions made to um, in, information that's pertinent to essentially doing our job and helping a resident. Mm -hmm. Okay, I heard council member nine seconds. Sorry, I saw your hand too. Um, so we have that. Uh, any other questions or anything else uh, regarding this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstain? All right, that passes. We'll move on to public works. We have no for information items. We'll move into for action. We have three items. The first is the proposed city consultant agreement for the preliminary design of structure 3-107 on Wild Forest Creek Road. Rick. Thank you, Chair. Um, council members, um, this issue is, per, pertains to a stormwater drainage structure that's located on Wild Horse Creek Road. Um, we have in the corridor of Wild Horse Creek Road between Austin Fort and Route 109, there's three older uh, stone masonry stormwater drainage boxes. We think these are around 100 years old, potentially. I really don't know exactly what they date to. Um, we put extensive work into, into two of the three already to uh, extend their lives. The third, which, one, which is located closer to Centaur Road, uh, we have noticed a concern relative to the west side of the structure, the wing wall on the northwest corner of that, that structure has essentially settled. Uh, there is some ongoing scour um, and erosion around the, the west end of that structure. And it's, it's the result of the stormwater coming through the structure and also the water in the creek. So the, um, the condition of that structure and the wing wall is really um, certainly uh, got our, gotten our attention and uh, it's uh, such a situ the situation is such that we really need to do something to address it sooner rather than later. So we are moving forward um, uh, right now and trying to come up with a plan to expedite the replacement of the structure, make any temporary repairs that we can, that we can. And then uh, also uh, hopefully on Thursday, uh, we're going to shut that section of the road over the bridge down to a single lane. And the thought is at least to reduce the likelihood that you get two vehicles on that structure at any given time um, passing each other. So the plan is to restripe it in the vicinity of the structure. It is only 11 foot long. So this is not a bridge, it's a box culvert. 
um, it's a smaller structure, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a safety concern. So the thought is to restripe the road over the structure as a one lane bridge. And we do have a, a one lane bridge. I'm, I'm sure some of you know, close to Austin, Austin Fort road. One of the bridges that we are working on plans to replace, uh, at the other end is a one lane structure. So this isn't uh, unusual by any stretch. Um, it'll be unique um, or new for drivers, uh, obviously once they encounter it, but it's not uh, unusual for that section of the road. So um, again, kind of three parts, we're trying to expedite plans, replace the structure, look to make any short-term uh, repairs that we can, and then reduce the traffic loading on that structure. We did meet today with Tom Kelp uh, with Kelp Contracting to, to kind of get some ideas from Tom relative to short-term repairs that we could make. And obviously the, the water that's running through the structure is, is uh, infiltrating through the box, through the bottom of the slab. Uh, it's cracked, it's old, and it needs to be repaired. So the first thing we're going to try to do from a short-term perspective is to repair the bottom of the, the slab of the structure. Try to avoid the water infiltrating into the into the subgrade around the, the, the wall, the wing wall and the, and the structure itself. So um, hopefully we can come up with some repairs there that are reasonably low cost. There may be some other ideas that we'll explore as well that could be a short-term repair. But I think ultimately we need to move forward with a project to replace that structure. Um, given where it's located, um, we will likely need an easement from the state parks because Babbler is all along that frontage on that uh, Eastern side. And then the property to the west, there is a private property that will also likely need an easement from as well to, to do work or to, to replace that structure. So essentially the recommendation to the committee, I have a, a proposal from Cochrane Engineering to begin the engineering process to develop a preliminary plan to replace the structure, which I'd like to move forward with as soon as possible. That will include surveying and development of easement um, documents so that we could get an easement from the state parks and potentially the adjacent property owner if necessary um, to do that work. So the recommendation is to move forward with a agreement with Cochrane Engineering to complete the preliminary engineering of plans to replace the structure in its entirety. The cost of that would be no more than $43,200. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over for any questions that you may have. All right, do we have any questions or motion uh, preferably with the recommendation made by the department? That's member Clark. Uh, Director Brown, what about those other two? Um, are they in bad repair also? Um, it's obviously a good question. So the other two structures, we've actually put some significant uh, repairs into place over the last year. We had uh, T-Hill construction um, patching the insides of them pretty extensively. Um, so we, we believe that they are in, in much better condition and they are not subject to the same issues um, that this, this structure is uh, given the location of the creek. And I say creek, Wild Horse Creek, it's located right at the terminus of the structure. Um, that combined with the constant flow of water through this one, um, it, it's a little different situation, but the short answer is no, we don't believe they're in, in the same condition or are in poor condition like this one is, but we will keep a closer eye on them as well from, the, from that perspective. All right, Council Member Clark. Yeah, the um, the one that we're talking about, um, you said that we didn't want two cars coming. Is that for the location of the car on the road or because of the weight for the two cars? What What is the reason behind that? It's for both. So we're gonna, we would reduce it to a single lane. So there would be not, there wouldn't be the chance for two cars to be loading that structure at the same time. Just one vehicle would, would in theory be crossing at any given time. Um, but it also takes the load and it moves it more towards the center of the structure. The immediate concern is on the west side of that structure. So if we can move the load to the center of the structure, um, it would let, I think, us sleep a little better at night, uh, given the condition of that wing wall. I'm just uh, wondering about the, the weight of the vehicles that are going through that area. You know, I know that, you know, we, we try to limit it, but um, sometimes do we have large trucks going down through there, um, maybe from um, some of the businesses over on, on uh, North Etherton? 
Well, certainly we do have some large trucks that uh, make their way through Wild Horse Creek Road, but overall it's a fairly low volume road um, relative, relative to many others, but that doesn't preclude the opportunity for a larger truck to be on it. There are load restrictions already in place on that structure. So um, by engaging Cochrane, that does allow us to at least revisit some of those concerns as well uh, to be sure that we can keep it safe for all vehicles or take appropriate measures. Thank you. Councilmember Farmer. I'll make the motion. Okay, Councilmember Farmer makes the motion uh, for the department's recommendation. Um, made a uh, second by Councilmember Hopper. Do we have any other questions on the motion or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstain? Motion passes. Moving on to the next item, the proposed city consultant agreement for design of the Route 109 sidewalk from Manchester Road to south of Viola Bill. Rick. Um, thank you, Chair. Again, um, it's another <clears throat> proposed uh, agreement with a consultant. Uh, this project is on our capital improvement program for 2022. We have a small project to construct a short section of sidewalk. This is along the east side of Route 109, um, south of Viola Gill down to Manchester Road. Um, it's kind of a remaining gap in a length of sidewalk and or trail, frankly, that runs, I mean, to the south of there from the YMCA all the way up. So it's a really nice gap to fill, frankly. That's my personal opinion. We'd get a lot of bang for the buck if we can get this project done. So um, the project has already been primarily designed. And when HR Green was doing the design work for the roundabout improvements to the north on Route 109, we, we were able to conclude the development of the plans in that work, frankly. So most of the engineering and the survey work has already been completed. Um, we do have plans and a cost estimate prepared for the work. So this effort that we're bringing to you tonight is the final steps to allow us to wrap things up, um, get the project out for bids um, and get the necessary approvals that we need from Metro West as they will have to grant an easement to us and MoDOT is they will have to issue a permit for the work. And we also have to finish up some utility coordination. I believe the utility, I, I believe that the gas company does have a small adjustment that would have to be uh, made to construct the project. So um, the recommendation is to uh, execute a city consultant agreement with HR Green for the not to exceed amount of $11,000 to allow us to finish up those final steps um, and then proceed to uh, bid the project for construction. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over for any questions. Council Member Eads. I would like to go ahead and make a motion with the recommendation by the department. And I will say that you don't have to live in Ward 8 to enjoy the connectivity of the sidewalks. And I, I, I you know Ward 8 gets everything and Ward 2 just doesn't get enough, but I will say I'm excited that this segment will be completed and I enjoy walking around town center before the farmer's market and and everything that we do that that makes that area more connected will be used by people and more you know and invaders from more two like me as well so i'm excited uh, to see this project that, director Brown. that's okay we don't even have a park in ward eight so we'll be happy oh. with the oh. all right uh is there a second council member farmer all right Anyone else? Councilmember Clark. Now, I also wanted to say that same thing, that I appreciate that, um, Director Brown, uh, that, to go ahead with that project and the good job that you've done on pushing that forward, because um, that is a connection that um, people in wheelchairs have told me they really needed and to get to the to the streetscape, to enjoy the, the new um, sidewalks we have there and that will help them a lot. Are we all in compliance with the, the slope on those? I could I looked on these pictures that I, um, these drawings that I, I printed out, but you know, I'm getting kind of old and I cannot read these little, the little print to see if that slope, what the slope is. Um, Council Member Clark, yes, we will have to meet the ADA criteria that that's in place and effectively the, the main criteria is the cross slope. That's the easy one, which is usually usually designed at one and a half percent rather than the 2% being the max. We usually do them at one and a half percent. And then the gradient of the trail, usually we keep it 
at 5% or less, or there are cases where you can match the grading of the road if the road is deeper, but this is designed to be, I don't know the maximum grade, but it's going to be 5% or less to meet the ADA. And if I, can I say one more quick thing to follow up? I, did, I meant to, to point out to y'all that um, Dan Ron is with us. Dan is quietly sitting down here taking notes. If you're wondering who the gentleman was, Dan is our assistant city engineer. And so he's helping me with getting these projects you know, off the door and under construction. So just wanted to introduce him. I apologize for not doing it earlier. But what really reminded me of it was that Dan's taken a um, fairly extensive, we're, we're trying to take advantage of the free training opportunities that are out there. And, and recently there's been some, some ABA training opportunities that, that are, uh, have been made available. So Dan is actually participating in a three day, three days? Um, ADA training. So just to let you know, we are trying to keep up on it and um, be as educated as we can. And there's been a lot of, I'm getting a little off topic here, but just my personal opinion is that, that MoDA and East West Gateway have been quite good at um, pushing this issue of ADA compliance for some time now. And I think in large part in this area, most cities are actually doing pretty well, um, or at least are aware of the situation relative to the public right away. And um, we can talk more about that another time if, if you like, but I just wanted to mention that. Okay, we've got the motion on the floor then. So we'll see you know what a discussion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstain? Motion passes. Now that brings us to our last item, which is the recommended projects for TAP federal funding applications in wards five and eight. Thank you, Chair. Um, Council members, this last item um, pertains to the next round of federal funding, which is available for uh, submittal of applications. Currently, the current round is the Transportation Alternative Programs, which is funding that is earmarked essentially for non-motorized purposes. And we have used this in the past to fund trail projects and box culvert, or excuse me, uh, pedestrian tunnel projects. So. Um, it is intended for those kind of uses um, rather than typical roadway projects and that kind of thing. Um, it has to have a transportation function, so it can't be used for a park strictly, but it would, needs to provide a transportation function. So the uh, deadline is August 19th for the, for the funding application. There's about $16 million available in Missouri, so not a, not a large amount of money. Um, but we certainly have been successful in the past uh, submitting applications. And the Old State Road Trail, as you may recall, um, was our most recent funding application under that program that we did get selected. So for this round, um, put a couple ideas um, in front of you. And, and the idea was to present both of these to you for your consideration tonight. Um, and if one or both are good ideas, uh, we would proceed getting doing a little bit of conceptual engineering design on both or one or whichever you'd prefer. Um, because if we submit an application, we'll need to know more details relative to the cost and the scope of the project. So the, the request tonight is to get an approval on one or both of these projects, or if your desire is none, that's the answer we will take forward. Um, if there's a desire to move forward with one or both, we would like to complete a little bit of conceptual engineering to come up with more firm cost estimates to construct these projects, and then bring that information back to you at a subsequent meeting, either in July or August, to allow us enough time to finalize the application and take it to city council to get a resolution passed. So that's the, uh, the recommendation. The two projects, the first was the Ethton Road, um, what I've called the path. Essentially, we do have a project on our capital improvement program to improve Ethton Road. This is from Manchester Road, the new streetscape section north up to Cambury. Essentially, the idea here would be to split out. Um, as part of that project, they were it is intended to add pedestrian and bike facilities on that road. We you do see quite frequently folks are walking um, in the street on that section of road. There is no sidewalks whatsoever if you're familiar with that section. Um, so the the intent here would be to split out the path on the east side of the project as a separate project, request funding for it, and then move forward with that independent of, of uh, additional or further improvements to the road. 
Um, I would say that we do plan to resurface that section of road this summer with our, our annual resurfacing project. So that will occur already this summer to improve the surface. So we would be proposing a 10 foot wide path on the east side of that section of road. Um, and I would expect that we would incorporate town center style street lights and then either street trees or landscaping as part of that project um, as well. That's my expectation. Um, and it would, it would comply in, in, by and large with the, the improvements that were previously scoped for Etherton Road. The second project is what I've called the Green Pines Park Connector Path. And this would construct a trail that would connect from the villages of Brightleaf subdivision all the way through uh, to Green Pines Park. And you might be familiar with the villages of Brightleaf. There was a trail that was constructed and essentially loops to a dead end um, at the north of that subdivision. Um, but there is a roadway, the former roadway corridor that did not move forward, still exists. And I believe it was always been the intent that someday to pursue a potential path in that corridor. And now that the park is in place um, at the end of uh, at the end of Pond Grover Parkway to the north, this would allow us to connect to that park from Brightleaf on the south. And I think it would be a, a really nice connection to make. Um, it is not in Ward 8 um, either. So, <laughs> but I think it would be a heavily utilized trail in my opinion, and it would be, be a nice connection to the park. And you could also argue it would allow a pedestrian connection to the Green Pine School, which is not that much further away from the villages of Brightleaf. So those are the two projects. And at this point, I'll, I'll turn it over for any, any questions that you may have. I don't have good cost estimates, but I would expect both of those would be around a million, maybe three quarters of a million to a million dollars in rough. That's just my rough idea without, without having really looked at it at this point. But I think that's probably where you're looking at cost-wise. Each, yes. Council member Farmer. Uh, <clears throat> I'd be happy to make the motion. I mean, I think getting stuff connected is a good thing. I just had a quick question and yeah, looking at this aerial picture, it's a little hard to tell. I assume it's maybe a Brightleaf situation, but I don't know if it's possible to make an additional little spur onto whatever is near Rising Star Drive and Sand Cherry Drive so that those people can also relatively easily get to this path. Um, but I think both of them look pretty good. There. So I'd be, I would make the motion to proceed forward with some plans and see what we can do. <clears throat> there a second for the motion. Anybody, Council Member Jack? Any other questions on the motion, Council Member Evans? It's a it's a question. I support the motion, but it's a question about a, another future tap project idea. So if you'd like to take it now, but if it's if it's not germane, I can hold my um, horse. I think it depends. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> just it's just a, it's just a question for for Director Brown. So okay. I have a lot of residents that live in Brentmore on Valley Road, and occasionally I run into them in uh, Valley View, which backs up and connects to another subdivision um, on Valley Road, and so they are getting getting there essentially up to Crestview without sections of sidewalks. There's a lot of single okay. homes. Um, the other side of the road is Clarkson Valley. So I was just wondering, uh, could we look at essentially building a connection to, to kind of Brentmore? That would be the logical place to stop it because that's the last major subdivision. And if we provided a crossing, uh, I could, it would accommodate a lot of subdivisions on the right-hand side going that direction. So um, can, can we explore that in the future as well? Right. You want to take that off uh, offline and look into Sure, that? we can we can talk about it. We did, um, Councilman Readins, we did get approval, tentative approval for our federal funding for that Valley Road project. So we included in that that gap of sidewalk at Brentmore on the one side, there's a very short gap. <clears throat> the intent was that with, at the very least with that project, we would fill that gap. And it would connect all the way up. So there'd be a, a basically up to Crestview. I think that's the only gap remaining only on that gap side. That I can, yes. Okay. I believe okay. that's correct. Two two Brentmore. Excellent. Thank you. All right. 
Council Member Clark. Yeah, Director Brown, um, I'm just curious about the the selection of this the project and compared to our strategic plan, because we have a list of things that we came up with on the strategic plan, and some of them were sidewalks and um, under public works. Um, I'm not opposed to this at all. I'm just saying that if we're going to substitute this for something on the strategic plan, we should do so instead of just um, adding to it without taking care of the things that we already deemed priority. And I, that's certainly fine. I, I, I guess I'm trying to remember if there's a project in particular that we might want to think about. Um, let me know. I know the, the one gap on, on Valley of Brentmore was one that I was thinking we could address in that future project. Um, but if there's another one out there, um, I'm certainly we could take a look at it. Well, I'm re remembering the one on um, Manchester Road between 109 and Pond that we had talked about. And then um, during COVID, we put that aside for a while. But um, my main point is just that we, we made the strategic plan. We need to stick with it or change it. Sure. Uh, does the do tap grants also um, would that work for adding the types of guardrail along 100? I know we talked and it is on the strategic plan about adding um, matching guardrail with the wood on the front on there certain segments along 100. Could could we also do an application for that as well? I walk that a lot, and there's some areas that that feel exposed. And since we did have a car at the barrier at Starbucks, it's not out of the realm of possibility that a car would veer off the road in the future. And that gap would be more of a concern and a liability. And so I know it's been been talked about, but um, would that qualify for this type of program? Um, Council members, I can check. I don't think that it would, but okay. we can certainly double check and, and respond bond back on that. Okay, if, if not, I mean, I, I would love to see that come back in the future soon okay. in some form. Yep. All right. I we'll see no other hands up. We've got a motion on the floor. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstain? Motion passes. All right, then with that, we don't have any other items for discussion or action tonight. Um, next meeting, well, miscellaneous, anything on the miscellaneous? All right, next meeting will be Tuesday, July 5th at 5.30. So adjournment, is there a motion? Oh, Council Member Bertolino, go ahead. Yeah, on, on the uh, future, um, future agenda items, um, did you want to mention sewer lateral tonight? Um, it, it is here and it's listed for future. I can certainly comment uh, on I was, it. I was gonna comment on something else first and then I was gonna queue yeah. you up if you want to talk about that. Yeah, but. no, that's that's fine. I'll take a, a minute to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so some of you might recall uh, that back around 2013, the city put on the ballot uh, for citizens to vote for a sewer lateral insurance program. Uh, unfortunately, that vote failed at the time. Uh, the reason that this is back is because I learned of a resident uh, up the street from me in my neighborhood that one day had sewer problems. There was no uh, water wasn't flowing down the sewer, it backed up into the basement. So they called Rotor Rooter. They looked into the line. They tried to run. They kept hitting something somewhere in the line. Uh, they did something then that kind of flushes out the line and they were able to see that the sewer line had collapsed. Unfortunately for this person, they kind of had the worst circumstances and apparently this does occur around our city where this main sewer main was very far from the house. It was across the street and where the break took place was at the middle of the street. So in order for this person, in order to access their sewer, they had to break the street. Uh, it was 11 feet down, so they had to pay for special equipment to protect the workers while they were down there. 
They had to pay for traffic control while the street was being uh, broken up. They also paid for a new street for the city uh, because that's what it takes to get to fix their sewer line. Uh, at the end of the day, they were on the hook for $30,000. And that is completely the responsibility of the resident, the lateral. The, the main is handled by the MSD, but any lateral, whether it's water or sewer, is dependent on the homeowner. And homeowner's insurance is not going to cover because they told her that the property was not hers. It was the middle of the street. So Rick is familiar with it. So very bad situation, a burden for this person. You know, they had three kids in college, you know, 30,000 out of nowhere just to fix their sewer. And that doesn't include what they had to do for their basement. And um, I've heard that come up as well, even in an unrelated conversation. One of our members of Celebrate Wildwood, who does real estate, mentioned it's coming up more and more. And Rick says he gets about a call a week about sewer lateral. And so I would love for us to really look back into what can we do to protect these citizens that rely on municipal sewer service like MSD um, so that they're not getting caught off guard with a $30,000 bill. And um, that's why it is on the agenda. So I just want to provide that context and something to think about uh, to see how we can help people prevent this. St. Louis County does have a sewer, sewer lateral insurance program, but because the resident lives within Wildwood, they're not covered. And there are multiple municipalities, my understanding, I think Rick, you told me, that have sewer lateral insurance programs. So we're probably one of the few that doesn't have one. Joe, did you say this was on the ballot in 2013? Back in 2013, yeah. And this is for voter approval, not for council approval, and yeah. it was put down? It was put down. It would be the way it would be billed is it would show up in your tax bill and then that coverage covers you. Now, uh, Rick might have some more details around that and we can certainly wait till then. I mean, it's but, you know, certainly education and finding what's the best way to be able to make this work, because we do have parts of our city that are not covered by MSD. And certainly I can understand those concerns. They wouldn't be, and I don't think they would be responsible at all for paying that fee because they don't have municipal sewer service. So they wouldn't uh, be obligated because they can't benefit from the lateral, but there's details we need to look into. So Rick, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add, but. Well, you, you won't. I mean, I would support this 100% personally. I mean, it's it's a problem that's only going to get worse as homes age. And that's kind of what you hear when you talk to people is as homes are getting older, there's more chances those lateral, laterals are going to fail. So um, yeah, I would just encourage this issue moving forward because it's an expensive repair and it's, no, it's a repair no one wants to make, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, uh, more to come on that when we revisit the topic. Councilmember Berlin. Oh, that, that it? Thanks for reminding me on that. So seeing no other miscellaneous sign, next meeting July 5th, can we get a motion for adjournment? Made by Councilmember Clark, seconded by Councilmember Farmer. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Want to oppose or abstain? Meeting adjourned. Thank you.